Hi there folks, welcome to uh, another WPF Real World video. Uh, my name is Nick Page from Microsoft uh, UK, DPE. And I'd like to introduce a couple of guys in just a minute from the user experience team here in, uh, in the UK. Uh, doing a lot of WPF work for the last ooh, 12 plus months. And, and what I want to do uh, for this particular video is to, is to capture some of their experiences with how designers and developers uh, work together. Um, and we talk a lot about the theory of this uh, in our presentation around WPF and how they can just work uh, side by side, it's all lovely. But in practice, um, I just wonder whether that's, that's really the case or not. And these guys have done a lot of um, you know, point, proof of concept uh, labs and such like. And so I want to grab some of their experiences. So, so um, this is uh, Paul, Paul Tyler. And here. From the UK team. I'm a developer. <laughs> and uh, and this, this is Martin, Martin Grayson. Hello, I'm a designer. So, we, uh, you'll notice that they're not sitting too close to one another, that's probably very wise. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, let's, let's, let's kick off, guys, with, uh, with a few questions, if I may. So, um, you know, historically, um, the, it's been an interesting relationship between designers and developers when working on a project together. And you know, certainly, my experience, you know, designers will come up with some lovely you know, design. And then they'll sort of pass over to the developer, and then the developer will then sort of try to to to, to contrive that in their you know their favourite language, and of course ends up not necessarily looking anything like what the designers come up with. Um, is, is that your experience as well? That's definitely how it used to be. Um, I think with WPF there is an opportunity to change that. I think you still can work in that way, so people can draw the designs, and then um, the developer can go off and try and recreate those designs, but. Um, now we've got SAML, which is this markup language, sort of a bit like a super HTML, if you will. I know you can create .NET objects with SAML, um, you can do all sorts of things with SAML, but basically the main usage of it today is uh, sort of a bit like a super HTML, doing fancy UIs and great animations and things like that. And the designer and the developer can work together on that. And uh, we've done quite a few PLCs where we've come up with different variants of that system really, you know, different flavours. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. It, was a, it used to be quite a difficult uh, relationship where I would create a, a design in, a, in some kind of drawing package. I'd then print out that design uh, and then pass it on to Paul. He would then come back to me and ask for all kind of small little parts of that design in individual image files so we could then include it uh, in the project, add it to buttons, add it to the background if it was a, if it was a website. So it was quite tricky to, um, for me to give a design to Paul and for him to be able to you know, use that design in the interface simply without having to kind of keep on coming back to me and uh, to, get more, uh, to get more information or get more assets from me. Mm. So you, talk, I mean, you introduced, you introduced uh, XAML there um, and can we talk a little bit more about XAML, maybe take a look at, at XAML and how that actually works in, in, in practice? With, you know, with designers and developers? I mean, what, what is the XAML thing? The XAML is XAML, which is Extensible Application Markup Language. And it's an XML uh, format, but it's a markup language. So basically, you can take any .NET object, um, say, call it brush or something, and you create a C-sharp class called brush, and it would have properties, say, color and thickness and things like that. And then you can just create that in, in XAML in a markup language, and you just say angle bracket brush, uh, thickness equals three and it'll convert it point and actually create one of those objects on the fly. So it's a very generic tool for, for creating these objects and, mm. uh, and combine that with a very powerful .NET um, graphics library, which is WPF, and you've got yourself a really nice combination, really. Mm. Maybe we can take a look at that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Okay, so what I've got open here. Oh, just uh, the... Uh, yeah. Try and zoom in a little bit better on that. There we go. Apologies to all of you guys watching this because I'm, I'm not holding the screen very steady, am I? So I hope you can read that right. Uh, I'm going to increase the font size actually. It's yeah, that'd be great. Probably a bit small. Ordering all the fonts now, so it's taking a while <laughs> to do its nice previews. So. It's about the size of 16. Let's say 20. Uh, that's a bit better. I can zoom out and don't keep it quite so still. Excellent. So, so this is that, is it? 
This is XAML. Um, what I've got open is a WPF Windows application. If you can just look at the right hand side in Solution Explorer, I've got a file called window1.xaml. So this is where I write all the XAML, we create all the XAML which will be used in the uh, user interface of the application. If I expand window1, I've actually got a C sharp file that sits behind. Um, in this file, I can actually write code against all the things I create in XAML, uh, as well as... Looks a bit like ASP.NET. I mean, in terms of having a code behind files, is that similar to the model? It's, it's really, really similar. It's, uh, it's, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things here that, are, that you would recognize kind of immediately from, uh, from ASP.NET, mm. absolutely. Okay, so... If I have so, so this is obviously currently in Visual Studio, and, and what, what, have we, what have we got on there so far? Not a lot. We've got something called a grid. Not a lot. So I've got a simple container, simple container control. I'll say simple, it's actually quite a, a clever container control called a grid, which actually allows you uh, to create rows and, um, and columns, and then lay out pieces of UI sitting in each of those rows and columns. Uh, and then that can actually be like an HTML table, really. Yeah. A bit like an HTML table, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so if I hit F5, uh, this will run the application, you can see that I've actually just got uh, a blank window. Mm. So maybe to start with, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I might want to put a button in here. So I've opened up an XML tag. Uh, I've got IntelliSense in Visual Studio 2005. Uh, I can throw in button, close it off, and say, let's give some content that says hello world. If I hit F5 again, is our, I've got a big button that takes up the whole of my screen, and now that says hello world. Right, okay. I can do, I begin to do some things about uh, with the button, so I can actually say, actually, I want this height, the height of this button to be 20, uh, and I want the width of the button, say, to be uh, 50. You can see now I've got a, a very small, mm. small button that's uh, 20 pixels high and 50 pixels wide. And it's not just buttons that we have in XAML. Uh, there's a whole range of controls, so you know, I can have a, I can have a text box, I can have a text block, which is just some static text. Uh, things like check boxes and radio buttons. Uh, these are all kind of the controls that we recognise from from Windows, uh, from Windows development. But what XAML also gives us is a whole range of new new controls, which allows us to kind of draw uh, shapes and paths and more complicated things. So one of these, for example, is a rectangle. So I can throw in a rectangle, uh, and I can give this rectangle a fill. Let's say blue. I can give it a height of 100 and say a width of 200. I can even begin to think about how I want to position this rectangle. So let's say I want to put it in the top left hand corner of my user interface. I can actually begin to say a vertical alignment top and then a horizontal alignment left. Mm, okay. I close it off and I run. We've now got a, a big blue rectangle. Martin, you're an awesome designer. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so how does, this, how does this help us in terms of designers and developers working together then? So, so I, I kind of, I'm getting an idea of what, what XAML is. Just switch to the design view. I don't actually have the design view right. but uh, actually no, I might have. So what I'm switching to here is uh, the WPF designer, uh, Slider, which is a, uh, a visual designer that sits within Visual Studio. Okay. Uh, shipping with uh, Orcus. Uh, and again, it's similar to kind of the Windows forms. But I guess what you're asking is, in terms of what does this give designers and developers, uh, you know, so far as workflow and how they're going to actually, you know, produce a, an application together. Yeah, because we've sort of talked, we talked about how designers you know, just, uh, they'll use their favourite, you know, graphics design tool to come up with, with something and then they'll just pass it over to you, the developer, and you end up coding it. In what, I guess what I'm trying to get at here is in what way does XAML help overcome that, that hurdle um, that, that, we, that we, we hit every time a designer passes something to a developer and then, and then back the other way? What we've got here is the code that makes and, and, and draws the user interface is separate from the code that provides the logic the user interface. So designers now have a, a language that they share with developers, that is XAML. Uh, if they can then produce their user interface and produce their uh, the look and feel that they're trying to achieve in XAML, developers can continue to write the application logic and, and all the smart stuff that happens in the background separate from, from the code that's uh, 
that's drawing the user interface. It completely right. ab abstracts the UI. Okay. Uh, and this 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 language XAML is is the thing that is what's going to is what's unifying designers and developers. Right. So what we're seeing there, so we've got there we've got a design tool inside Visual Studio because Visual Studio is still very much a a developer's tool. So I guess great that gives the developer some you know a representation of what the screen will look like, just like they have Windows Forms, uh, and obviously they can they can actually go and. It could go and hand crank example itself, but in, in 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 reality, when we start getting into complex designs, we're going to be wanting a designer to do that stuff and then pass it over to a developer. Mm -hmm. So what what do we have then in terms of design tools that can do what you say, generate XAML, and then be sucked into Visual? I mean, can it be stuck, sucked into Visual Studio and worked on by them both at the same time? Absolutely. We're actually launching um, later on this year a, a suite of design tools. Uh, it's called the Expression Suite. Uh, and there's a couple of tools in there that are actually design designer focused tools. So they look like designer tools. All the uh, things that you do with them are kind of very or very design orientated tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, and what those tools actually produce is they produce XAML, which can be immediately used in a uh, in a Visual Studio project. In fact, uh, one of those tools, Expression Blend, you open the Visual Studio project in Blend, uh, which is where you uh, design and and create your user interface. So, okay, so we've got so we've got a project here, which is a Visual Studio. It was, well, it's a WPF solution or you know project. Mm -hmm. We've got it open in Visual Studio. Can we have a look at how it open in? Um, Absolutely. In Blend. Okay, so let's throw, throw open Blend. So this is Blend. This is uh, this is what we're in now. Uh, this is this is my design tool. So as a designer, I'm immediately looking at this, thinking, Wow, there's a lot of things that I recognise here. I've mm -hmm. got to panel down the left hand side full of you know halving tools and shape tools and uh, you know there's, there's a few things here that are that are going to be new to me as far as controls and and, and containers and layout panels. Right. Okay. But, but on the whole uh, it's a friendly environment. If I open up the project uh, you'll be able to see it a little more. So you're gonna have to bear with me just while I find uh, You're gonna go about the same project. I'm gonna that same project absolutely. Same projects. In here, so oh, there it is. So this is the Visual Studio solution file. What I would normally open the project in Visual Studio with. I'm actually going to open up that same solution file in Blend. Okay. Oh, sure enough, there it is. And we can see that we have uh, we have our user interface. You can see the same project files down the right side, very similar sort of view. Uh, okay. So what happens if we now? So we say we could now manipulate that design in here and then pass it back? Could we do that? Absolutely, yeah, sure. So uh, what I might want to do is I might want, as a designer, I might want to draw a, a pretty custom shape. Well, not that your design needs improving, well, obviously, Martin. No, well, obviously not. This is not really a, <laughs> a beautiful app. So what I'm going to draw here is I'm just going to draw a, a star using a, a pathing tool. Okay. Something like that. Right. Uh, again, I can use the graphics package to... Uh, I've just clicked on the properties tab, and this has opened up a whole bunch of properties that I can now use to uh, improve the visual appearance of the star. So mm. I think kind of stars are most commonly yellow. Um, and I might want to increase the stroke thickness and perhaps make that a slightly darker orange. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so we're, we're, good. we're looking good. Uh, I can move, obviously, parts of the user interface that have already been drawn here around. So I can actually say, actually, I can't see all the text on that button. That doesn't look very good. So that's, uh, that's pretty nice. That's something very simple. I mean, I've only kind of added one object to the screen. But if I save this, switch back to my Visual Studio project, it's going to pop up and say, hang on a minute, something is updated in Window 1.0. So I'm going to say, yes, please update. And uh, if I look here, I can now see that uh, a new path has been added. So the path is the star object. If I just click on the top part, you can see that the user interface is now updated in, in size. So mm. I've got some very, uh, I've, got, I've got a whole bunch of powerful drawing tools available to me as a designer, uh, and I can work on the same uh, piece of code that my developer is working against. Mm. Mm. Uh, there's nothing, there's no, there's no part in between. The sample has unified that process; it has made it completely joined up. So we're no longer relying on developers to do a translation exercise, which. Frankly, they're, they're not always that good at. No disrespect to any of you developers out there, yeah. but I'm one of them, and uh, I, I think it's fair to say that. We're not all the best translators. No. So, okay, so that's great. So, all right, so, so that, that's obviously quite a simple example. Mm -hmm. in, um, in practice, 
What, um, let me just, just come right around here to see you guys. In practice then, what is that, you know, how does that really work? I mean, you guys have done quite a lot of projects here um, on, on WPF, involving designers and developers. Uh, how have you found that, that it really works in, in practice on a, on, a, on a real project? Yeah, we've found that actually it depends on the project. It's very different. I mean, obviously in that fairly simple example, you could imagine the uh, designer taking in the whole project and opening the entire project and editing the files and making all the changes. When you get a really complicated project, you find that um, you know so you need assemblies and things. You need quite a lot of stuff on the designer's machine just to make all all that all that work. So um, some of the times we've dropped down to, to authoring sort of small snippets of XAML. So rather than editing the whole scene, Martin would just edit a button or, or a button template or something, and would just pass over the, the button template, and we just or, or maybe he'll edit that into the into the, the design. Uh, but he won't actually open the whole design in, in, the, in the designer. So mm. working at a template, that's, that seems to be the common denominator. That the, on every project, we seem to be able to work with little snippets. And the thing that varies is the size of the snippet. And sometimes the snippet is, is the whole project because it's a fairly simple project. So. Mm. Mm. Okay. So we, when we were talking earlier, we, we sort of had four, I think you said it's four, didn't you, Martin? Four sort of different approaches that you, right. you've seen. Yes. Um, I mean, do you want to kind of walk through what those were and some of some of the benefits and, and, and downsides of, of those? So, yeah. So over the uh, over the kind of uh, last twelve months, we've been pulled have worked on a number of POCs together, and we've actually kind of been through four different ways of, of trying to find out what is the best fit for designers and developers to work together. Um, and I don't think there's a right answer. I don't think there's a right answer. No, I think they're all all valid. Depends on the project. Really. Yeah, a lot depends on your developer, uh, your designer. What, what kind of stage they're at. I mean, WPF, there's a learning curve for designers. Um, there's, there's things that they need to understand. Yeah, developers as well. There's a learning curve for developers, absolutely, yeah. as well. Um, but if I quickly show you the kind of four ways that we've been working on projects, um, one of those you know, would be would fit for a project. That would be great. So the first way is the, kind of tra the more traditional way a designer and a developer would work together. So a designer uses an art package that they already know very well which is going to allow them to create their design quite quickly. Uh, this is really where the designer is going to avoid WPF, uh, from the sense where they create a JPEG. Uh, they will then pass that over to the developer, who will then use the JPEG to, and a tool like Expression Blend, to create the XAML. Uh, now, the only reason this is, this is different to the divide that we saw before is that the developer now has a tool, XAML, that allows them to very much easy, in a much easier way create what the designer has created in uh, their graphic without having to write kind of custom drawing classes for Windows or the web. Like two got all the things right. like shading and uh, you know, fills and things like that. Right. So you've so, got the, the developer's got those tools. So this works well for a developer who maybe um, has got their head round blend and, and has got a bit, you know, a bit of an ability to do some design stuff. So now they've got a tool which, which is easier for them to use, a bit more familiar, and they can be spitting out XAML that they can then use in their project as well. Yeah, exactly. That? So Absolutely. You can take that XAML and just run it, as you saw in the example. Right. Absolutely. You need a developer. This guy here needs to be you know, somebody who, yeah, who can use the tool and can, you know, who really does appreciate design. <laughs> mm, okay. Okay, so that's, that's kind of way number. That's, that's very similar to the traditional way of doing it. The only difference really is. You've now got blend in the picture, Absolutely. but really the, the designer is producing pictures mm -hmm. and handing the pictures over to the developer, and the developer's reinventing the pictures. So that's very similar to the old way of doing it, really. Mm -hmm. Okay. The second way is slightly similar, but this time the designer he's going to use blend to design his user interface. So rather than using a graphics package, he's actually going to use Expression Blend to draw the UI. And what, he, what he's produced is a, a, a big chunk of XAML which describes the interface and, in essence, is the interface. He can then pass that, developer, pass that over to the developer, who can then take that XAML, add some C-sharp, or whatever language, and obviously that will package up as the application. Okay. So that's really what we just did, I suppose. In the Absolutely. Example. So the designer in Blend, creates a user interface, passes that 
piece of XAML over to the developer. Uh, the user interface is done as far as the uh, developer is concerned. It has all the controls on that he needs uh, and is ready for some interaction to be built with the C sharp. Okay. Now for that, you need the d designer really needs to understand that when they draw a square, it's not a rectangle or it's a button. You know, they can't draw use those terms interoperable. You know, they can't use mm -hmm. interchangeable. You've got to. If you want a button, you've got to make it a button. If you want a style button, you've got to style a button. You can't draw a rectangle and style it. You know. Okay, so this, this comes onto I mean, this comes onto an interesting question around this, this design. I mean, can a designer? But it seems to imply what you're saying. The designer can't just go off and kind of just sketch pad out what the UI is going to look like in whatever way they like. We've had um, a couple of instances of that. You've had a few instances of that. So, so what, what, can you explain a little bit more detail why they can't do that? So I mean, if, I, if I'm a designer, I just draw out whatever I like, sketch it out, pass it over to you, Paul, the developer. What, why, why is that a It's a bit like the old Dreamweaver days when, uh, when people developed um, uh, websites and the, the, the HTML was really complicated and had all these complicated tables in and nested tables and all the rest of it. And for anybody actually reading that, it's virtually impossible to read. And the same is true with uh, Blend. You can sit down and draw things in Blend and you can create groups and, and all sorts of stuff and you can make the, the XAML. If you, if you pay no regard to what the XAML is, you can create a really it's nice looking, but the actual XAML is just impossible to use. So what you can do, I and mean, that's sort of another way of working, you can use that as a basis for the UI, but just cut little bits out. It means you don't have to pass over, you know, uh, hex, ver hex versions of the colours mm -hmm. um, and all that sort of stuff. You can actually extract those from the XAML, but you don't really use the XAML. It's just, uh, just there. Right, OK. Was that, that another one you're going to come on to, Martin, as well? That's right, yeah. Oh. In fact, yes. Yeah, so Sorry, am I jumping No, no, no that's, that's great. So the key, thing, the key thing with that is, just before we move on, that particular process is that a designer has got to understand WPF. So it's very much a, that designer has to be quite a good developer, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they have to understand. They have to know about that. controls. And, yeah. And you know, they have to know a button is a button, a checkbox is a checkbox. I mean, yeah. one, one example uh, on a project we were working on, we had a, a rating control. So there's a, a piece of UI that was actually a, a five star rating. So similar to what we've just seen, the designer was using Microsoft Blend and he drew five stars in a row. Uh, and then pass that over to the developer. Now, as far all, all we've got there for the developer is just five individual drawings of uh, stars grouped. Uh, there's no interactivity there. It's not a control. It's not something that somebody can interact with. It's, it's just a picture. It, it, it may as well be a, uh, a PNG or, or a JPEG and, file. And, and just to be clear, each of those stars, when we talk about they just draw a star, what that actually looks like in XAML is just a, a, a set of Path, a chunk of data, a chunk basically. Of numbers, yeah. Just, yeah, just, just representing what the points are and the intersection between them, yeah. and that's it. Okay. So, so what did you do actually? I'm interested with that. We had, we had, we had to do uh, a fair amount of it. We had to do what we could use. Is we could use one of the stars that the designer had drawn as a, as a template for what star should look like, but we then had to write a list box which presented us with five stars, five of one of these, so we had a template that looked like a star, which occurred five times in a list box, and then we used the interaction of the list box to actually select the rating. Right, gotcha. The, okay. the only other problem with this, uh, particular flow as well, is that often it doesn't have, it, it doesn't really allow for uh, kind of encapsulation, encapsulation of parts within the XAML. The designer would typically draw the entire application in one big XAML file. Mm. Whereas, you know, we're going to talk about this later, but we like to break uh, applications down into small parts that might be reused across the app. There's another problem with this ver this version as well is that um, one of the nice things that about the first one that we had where you just draw pictures is the designer can maybe design the entire user interface in a week because they just literally sit there and draw things and they just I mean you can even draw them with a pen and paper you know and just draw out the whole user interface and you get a good overview of what the whole user interface is going to look like mm -hmm. because they can do it very quickly. If you're doing it this way, where they're actually drawing all the look and feel and making it controls and they're, they're trying to get it absolutely perfect, they're going to be quite a bottleneck. And they're going to be producing a page in a, you know, a, a one scene in a couple of days. You know, it's going to take them a long time to get there. So you never get the full discussion around how the whole application is going to be. So that's, that's one of the disadvantages. It's fairly efficient because you're not reinventing the wheel a lot, but you know, 
It's cost us for cost. That's why it depends on your application and, and the resources you've got available as to which of these models is the best. Right, okay. You need a dev friendly design for this one. Yeah. On that point, Paul, before we go to the next sort of workflow, um, I mean, how do you work internally? I often sort of walk around the offices here and I see, you know, drawings up, posted up all over the wall. Yeah. Uh, uh, which is almost sort of sketches of what the UI will look like. Is that, is that really how you, do you still kind of do that? You do that initial just sketching out pure design work, what we think the UI might look like, and then you move on to implementation? Yeah, that's very much part of the user experience uh, workflow that, we've, that we use in uh, Microsoft UK, is we uh, try and draw what we call wireframes, which are just sort of black line drawings of the user interface, and get the customer to sign off on that and agree that that's what they want. And you can, you can get rid of a whole lot of issues without writing a line, writing a line of code. Obviously, the other extreme is to write the whole application and have the customer come in and say, I don't like that, I want that changing, I want that changing. And that's a very expensive way of working, although it's a lot easier for a lot of people to visualize things if it's actually on the screen, but it's an expensive way of working. So a quick, 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 quickish wireframe diagrams, sign off on that, and then we start going to workflow that we're yeah. talking about here, effectively. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so um, what's, what's the next one you're going to talk about in the market? Okay, so the next one is kind of what we just seen, but the other way around. So the developer uh, creates uh, a, a fairly basic user interface. So it has the controls on here, might have a button, text box, and a, a list box. And he creates this in XAML. And so, yeah, presumably, given the wireframe diagram that they've got, we've yeah. talked about, that's actually not that hard to do. He's come actually with that, that basic. Yeah, getting the template. effects is, is probably quite difficult, but he can no. draw, the, he can make it a button. Yeah. Maybe a square button instead of a round button or something like that. Oh, yeah. What, yeah, what we've got feeding into here is the wireframes coming into uh, coming into the developer is simply recreating what those wireframes look like in town. So position laying out the controls on the screen and then you know perhaps writing a bit of C sharp to create some interactivity around those controls. Gotcha. What then happens is the designer takes the XAML and he'll open up this uh, piece of XAML in blend. So we're now looking at the designer. And what he'll then start to do is begin to address yes. he or she. I apologize. <laughs> what they will do is then start to kind of address the uh, the, the user interface and the, and the look and the style of the each of the kind of the individual controls that the developer has created, uh, and and design those individually uh, as well as perhaps you know creating things like perhaps there be a background for the application. And, uh, he might do some things to kind of adjust the layout of the application as well if things aren't quite in the right place. Mm. So the controls have already been placed on the, on, on the screen. The, the developer who knows what controls he wants, he, he, he's popped them onto the screen. Now the designer is going to the exercise of taking that and applying the visual design right. to the blend. So um, for that one you need much less the developer savvy designer in that the developer work's sort of been laid out in a framework before the designer gets their hands on it. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to know that that's got to be in a button in a group in a, and all, all that detail. That's all already been done by a developer. They've just got to do their beautifying process. And, and what, what do you say beautifying? Are we talking about styles here? What, what is that? I mean, arguably that constrains the designer in some way, which may be a good thing. What, what are the what does that beautifying really look like? What, what, what are we talking about? So, you know, for example, if, if, if I take uh, a button, uh, a regular rectangle button, you know, might look like something like this. But if we're creating quite a you know a visually wow application, our button you know might be a custom shape, it might be a rounded button that has a you know perhaps a kind of a glow that appears in the top and then when you put the mouse over it, you know, perhaps some more glow kind of emanates from, from within within the button outwards. So it's about you know taking the elements that are on the screen and applying a theme and a, and a visual presence to those elements that are Beyond just right. what the vanilla controls look like. And what in WPF are you using to do that? Are we talking about styles? Is that what we're talking about? We're talking about, yeah, uh, so there's a whole mechanism in WPF for changing the way things look and behave. There's styles and templates. Templates uh, are really what makes up a control. So for a standard button, a template might be a rectangle and then a text, a, a piece of text in the middle. That would be the template for this button. The template for this button might be a circle uh, with another circle creating a glow and then some kind of special effect which is going to create an outer glow 
kind of thing. So the template has actually become a little more complicated, but at the same time looks a lot better. What styles then do is you can use styles to set certain properties of controls and things that exist in XAML. So I might have a style that says uh, uh, I want I want to set I want to ensure that all the text that appears in this button is white. So I would use a style to put to set the text of this button to always be drawn in white. And when you mouse over it, it could turn red, and you could do that with the style. That's right. And yes, and when I mouse over it, I want the text to turn red. So I use the style to create a setter will turn the text red within the button. Right. So okay. there's, there's two separate things, stars and templates, but they work hand in hand. Okay. All right. So that, that sounds good. Um, I, I, I can actually kind of tell you a problem that we found with this particular workflow, though. Um, so one of them is obviously the developer knows what controls are on the page, uh, and he's now writing his C sharp against the controls that he's popped on the page. One of the problems you might see is that a designer who's we, you know, we specify doesn't have to be a dev savvy designer. Might think, oh, I'm not keen on that button being there. Simply delete the button and perhaps draw another button elsewhere. Now, of course, the developer is actually writing code against that button or against that list box. Mm. Uh, now, of course, that means that if the button's not there, something's going to break. The mm. project is, is, isn't going to run. So that's one problem that we uh, envisioned for this. Another one was actually a, a, an example that me and Paul suffered, and it actually took us a couple of hours of, kind of real head scratching oh, yes. before we worked out what happened. But um, <laughs> we, we created a video player, uh, a piece of user interface, uh, and we'd handed it over to the designer to add some visual, uh, some kind of visual wow to it, and kind of rounded some corners and put some nice gradients in the video panel. But at the same time, he wanted to see the video in the middle of this video panel represented is a black rectangle for its kind of I'm not playing statement. So in the UI, he simply drew a black rectangle in place of where the video was. Doesn't sound too bad. When he checked in his design and handed it back to us and we ran the application to test it, we were wondering why we couldn't see the video. Uh, we could hear the sound coming through the speakers, so we knew that the video was playing, but we couldn't for the life of us, you know, think why we, you know, why the video had vanished. And that's a very common problem with the early bits of WPF was that when a video didn't want to play, it played out as a black rectangle. So that was a very, it just looked like, oh, we've hit that boot again. Now, why have we hit that boot again? You know, we, start, we started blaming the technology, didn't yes. we? And kind of stamping off it, going, oh, this is <laughs> some rubbish. And then somebody found a black rectangle and deleted it. Yeah, found the rectangle, <laughs> deleted it, and it's all of a sudden the video reappeared. So. Uh, so, yeah, they can really mess the designs up. If, right. <laughs> so again, really the key here is that designers have got to be aware of you know WPF and, yeah. and and what's going on. Yeah. So there, I think it was the fourth one you mentioned. Is there a fourth one you mentioned? That's right, the fourth one, and probably the one that works uh, the best for us in terms of um, you know what we're uh, the, the way that we're approaching projects now. So we start off in a in a similar way. We've user experience team produces some uh, wireframes which we then pass off to the developer. We then start to draw the layout of the script. Now at the same time, a designer will take those wireframes and then a separate project, so this is now separate from the actual project that we're producing here, will begin to look at the wireframe and then in a similar way produce styles and templates um, for these controls. So we have a style, a template, and perhaps another style. What the designer will then do is he'll package these up in what WPF calls a resource dictionary, which is like a, um, a CSS style sheet for WPF, mm -hmm. a place where you can put in a whole bunch of visual, re it doesn't have to be visual resources, it could be data resources, different types of brush, but a whole, one, uh, a whole collection of resources in one big .xaml file. And you know, each of these will have a, a key, so you know, the developer will be able to see what this, this, that this resource relates to this control and this resource relates to this control. So this is what the designer is doing. The designer then passes that resource dictionary to the developer. And they use it like as a tool bag. 
Right. Just sort of pick things out in the tool bag and just say, well, I'm going to want a pink button here, or well, we've got pink buttons somewhere, haven't we? And this goes through the resource dictionary. Gotcha. Pulls out a pink button and hand cranks the XAML and, or you know, actually applies all the styles that have been developed in Blend to the various elements right. in the user interface. And this goes back to your earlier point about actually, yes, you can do some free form design, but you need to break it down into small components and, and put them in a resource dictionary so that. You know, they still make some sense to the developer rather than being some enormous great big chunk of That's right, yes. you know, XML fundamentally. And, and the enormous great chunk of XML can quite happily sit in the resource dictionary. Mm. And you can, in the design, you can collapse it all up into just line of stuff, line of stuff, line of stuff, and lots of lines of things. And you can actually see the resources fairly well. Um, but you don't have to actually understand any of the sound, and that keeps all the all the clutter out in the resource dictionary and keeps you can keep this main XAML file quite clean then. Right. And yeah. Yeah, the XAML file just has two buttons and a, a list box. It doesn't have all the additional drawing information that it requires to decide what they're going to look like. That all sits in this separate file. Now the downside of this one <laughs> is uh, you've got to you've got to get quite clever in how you break up your resource dictionary, otherwise you're going to get contention if you've got multiple designers. Because everybody wants to edit the resource dictionary because all the XAML's in there, uh, so you've really got to come up with a hierarchy. I mean, it's very flexible. You can you can divide it up how you want to do, but again, the more you divide it up, the harder it is to find things. So you know, it's the same problem with style sheets. Really, I mean, that was one of the nice things with um, with these toolbars that you can get for browsers is you can actually see which style is uh, working on which uh, on which element. You know, whereas it's not that easy now. Right. Okay. Got you. But you're saying this is this is the, t the approach you two typically take now mm -hmm. with with projects. Is that you found yes. this kind of a good balance between all different? Absolutely. I've, I've just finished a project where I was actually taking more of a developer role, uh, working with somebody who was more of a traditional designer. Um, and for us, this worked absolutely perfectly. Um, right. Okay. It, Sounds it, good. It meant that the uh, the code that was actually going into the application uh, remained kind of owned by me and I could manage and, and continue to look after that and make sure mm. that it continued to perform and the designer was still able to produce uh, assets and, and, and visual styles uh, with great So you were playing more of a developer role there, were you? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And presumably this also overcomes one of the challenges that I see is uh, that of source code control and obviously at the moment Blend, you know, this current version of Blend doesn't have uh, source code control. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how does it work in you know, you, you follow this sort of workflow, but in a big project where you've got a number of developers and designers, any anything you found that, that kind of works? How do you do source code control? I mean, you know, if you're if you're the designer, well, again, the the resource dictionary merges quite well. So if you've got multiple people on it, they tend to be working on different parts of the resource dictionary. So when you merge it in the merge, as long as you understand what merging is, which again, designers possibly aren't familiar with these sort of tools, um, and I'm not. Detriment of I can't design, so you know they have skills I don't have. So, um, uh, so you can actually merge these things quite, quite well. So that works works okay. But yeah, really, it's, so it's business as usual. Really. You've just got to break it down into sensible components that people can find a way around. So, I, th I think um, so far as managing source, um, I think any designer who's going to start looking at uh, creating designer WPF applications should probably download Visual Studio anyway. Uh, begin to really look at the XAML in Visual Studio and begin to understand you know, what it is that's being produced behind the scenes of what Blend is, is creating. So I think, uh, yeah, my top tip there would be to download Visual Studio anyway. And then if you're using source control, you can manage your source control through Visual Studio, but at the same time have the project open in Blend. So I can check out a file in Visual Studio, yeah. switch to Blend, do the work, and check it back into Visual Studio. Or right. Of course, if uh, Visual Studio is not available, whatever source control tool uh, they use, whether it's uh, mm -hmm. Visual Source Safe or... You know, I was going to say, I think you can get um, a standalone uh, client, can't you, for Team System. Yeah. Um, so I guess you could be using that as well. It actually bases itself on yeah. Visual Studio, but yeah. Absolutely. So, so another interesting thing that occurs to me with, with, with this whole area is, um, you know, fine, we're just piecing together the UI, uh, this all works very nicely, but you know, actually, an application typically involves a little bit more than just the UI. You know, typically involves um, data, um, you know, database, a data access tier, mid tier, whatever um, the structure of the architecture is. 
Um, as the application progresses, uh, you know, a designer wants to see a representation of real data, so does the developer of the UI as well. Uh, what are our options there in terms of, you know, I mean, we hear a lot about the great power of data binding in WPF. <laughs> how, does that all, how does that work in, in, in practice? Well, um, so with WPF, yeah, it's got a whole bunch of really uh, neat data binding uh, stuff that's kind of built in right out of the box. So a quick example would be yeah. you could, you could um, uh, say you've got a, a, te a list of uh, numbers, you could create a, a button, um, pretty, pretty hard, but create a rectangle whose width is the, width the size of the, all the numbers in the list, and you just do a data binding expression, you just put something like a rectangle, um, rectangle width, equals and then you put in quotes you just start the word binding and then you put the name of the variable that you want to bind to and you create a whole list of rectangles one with all, all of each width so that's almost you want just for that one line you've almost written a bar chart control mm -hmm. straight off the back you've now got colored rectangles one for each number right. and chart and so what about powerful and what about you know if you think I mean, a lot of people are familiar with you know, list boxes, you know, um, just binding that to some data. And yeah, again, list. if you're familiar with ASP.NET data binding and list boxes and things like that, ASP.NET, very similar concepts, so the, the skills definitely transfer forward into uh, WPF. So, yeah, so, so for us designers, um, Blend actually has some really, really good support for data binding. It's very easy to do something like this where we've taken a property of a rectangle and bound that to a property of something else. And you can do that with, with UI, can't you? There's, there's, there's UI. There's dialogues and stuff to do that. Isn't Absolutely. It? And there's also a user interface for bringing in data from external sources as well. So, so from RSS feeds and things from like RSS that. RSS feeds, exactly. So to, back, to go back to your original question. Is yeah, I'm, I'm, okay. just, just jumping in. I'm, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm one of the developers been chugging away that, you know, on, the, on the back end of the system. And uh, here you go. Here's an object. This is my, my collection class, my collection of... I don't know what items uh, they're going to be, and you now have to present those that, that collection of items in a list box. Mm -hmm. uh, how how am I going to do that? I mean, can I do that? In, can I do that in Blend? Yes, yeah, very that... again, it's very similar to the way you do in ASP.NET. You have a, a bit like a repeater. You just have a uh, an items template that you just specify the XAML that you want repeated for every item, and then boilerplate it with the names of the properties that you want substituting in there, and it'll just repeat it. And just okay. Your list. So that's great for an ASP on that chat. I'm a designer. I wish I were a designer sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Martin is a designer. Yeah. Um, you know, not familiar with that. Yeah. You know, I'm just giving him a, a, a class. I've given him an object. Yeah. Okay. I mean, how, how, what are you going to do? So there's a couple of things I can do to get this data or get a representation of what this data might look like uh, into the design time of Blend to sort of mm -hmm. design a user interface uh, around the data that's coming from Paul's class. So the first way, uh, and probably the simplest and, and, and quickest way, uh, especially if the data hasn't really been completely fleshed out and it's still a work in progress, uh, is to create a, a simple XML file, um, which contains you know, XML, uh, and it's got you know, the top level item, and then you know, attributes that uh, tie in with uh, time with the uh, properties that you have in your CLR object. So to create a, an XML file that has an array of items, has a list of items, it's very easy to incorporate that and add that to your blend project and then use that as a data source to be right. into the design time from. So potentially, you, you, your, designer de your UI developer and designer working together on the UI, mm -hmm. the UI developer Interactive code, right, you want to call it. He can just throw together a piece of XML so that you guys can be working on the UI. Yeah. And then, um, can, can you show me in Blend what that, how you then bind to that, or just give me a, a sense of that? I can show you that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Get back and try and get my, my camera nice and steady again. So I'm just going to fire okay. up a brand new instance of Blend, and we're going to go straight in and do a, a brand new project. Okay, so I'm going to add a uh, XML uh, data source. So I can, you can see here in the project panel, I've got a data uh, panel right here. And I'm going to click on add XML. 
And in fact, uh, what I'm probably going to do is I'm going to take uh, an RSS feed. I think that's probably a, a great thing to, to, to demonstrate. So if I go to, oh no, not the BBC, <laughs> excuse me, typo. If I go to the BBC website uh, and select a news RSS feed, so what we've got here is we've got a fairly typical RSS feed. I'm going to take the XML far from that RSS feed. So you've you, you copied the URL. I've copied the URL right out of Internet Explorer. Okay. And I'm going to pop in, pop it into the URL for the XML data. So this could right. be a local file on your file system. You know, something that perhaps Paul would have given me as uh, a representation of his data. Okay. Uh, today it's going to be a, an online RSS feed. Okay, great. I'm going to hit OK. So I focus just trying. Just be struggling to keep the screen still. Hey? That's okay. Um, what we can now see in the data panel is it's now looked at that XML file uh, and kind of shown me all the items that are in that XML file. And I can see here that one of them is actually a, a, an array of things called items. Mm. Uh, within that, I've got a, a, an article title, a link to it, and a description. So to actually begin to design a piece of user interface around that data, all I need to do is click on item drag it in, up will pop a menu saying, oh, what kind of repeating control would I like to rep use to represent this data? So I might say list box. Select list box. The field that I'm going to bind this information to is the item source of the list box. So I'm going to just OK that. And I'm now into a data template designer, which is actually going to allow me to select um, what things, what, what pieces of uh, information from that data I'd actually like to have appear in my user interface. So right. I'm now creating the little template that's going to get repeated for every item. Got you. So for every title, we're going to um, show some text yep. in a text block, and, uh, and so it goes on. So there you are. Say I just want the title and description drawn here. You've got a category tick, did you mean to do it? Oh, no, I don't want category. <laughs> in fact, yeah, why not, why, why not have category? And I've got actually got a little preview of what is going to appear in the list box right here. So now when I click OK, I've actually got that data. So this is at design time. I'm not running the application, but it's actually pulled down that um, pull down that information. And it would be very simple for me to now pop in here, say I want to edit the generated item template of this list box. So I've right clicked, come through here. And now I can begin to, you know, do things like I might want to apply some kind of uh, style or colour. Uh, obviously, it kind of looks a little clearer than. Right, gotcha. But you know, you can you can you can see what we're. Uh, mm. what now we're I can using. use the designer on that little bit of XAML that we've created. And, yes. And make it pretty. That's it. So yeah, this is actually uh, design time stuff. And now when I run the application. Naturally, I'll see the, uh, the fruits of my design, <laughs> design labour. Fantastic. So, yeah. Okay, and um, so that's a bit of X XML, mm -hmm. and now now things have moved on a bit in the project, and I've now got you know my developers caught up doing my mid tier. Yep. And he's given me you know a, 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 an object, a, you know .NET CLR object, which is a collection okay. of those things, of those items. What, 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 how would you deal with that? Nearly identical experience, actually. So, uh, funny you should ask. Here is a. Is, this is a kind of a bit of a blue. Beta Here's one I prepared time. earlier. Blue Peter. Blue Absolutely. Peter staff. All those who are sort of age remember Blue Peter. <laughs> so I'm in Visual Studio, uh, and I'm actually just going to quickly insert a couple of snippets of code, which are going to create a, a new type of CLR object and a, a, a another type, which is a collection of those objects. So the key thing here is that. Unlike with XML, where you could do it all just in blend, we, we do need to write just a little bit of code here to initialize the, the object to which we're going to bind. That's it? right, I'll show that in a second. So okay. this, first, this first class I'm going to add is, you know, whatever, whatever you do, I mean, you're going to have to have an object. And in this case, uh, for those of you that know me, I love Xbox games. So I've created <laughs> a, a, a class of type game, and this has a game title, a game publisher, a genre, but also a, a, an image. So this might be the, a class that's been passed to you. I mean, I could either be the source code, or it could actually be, um, you know, a, 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 in a separate assembly. That's right. That's part of the solution. That's it. We, we've included. We're going to put it all in the same assembly in this instance. Mm. But absolutely, it could be in, a, in another assembly. The next thing I'm going to add is actually a game object collection. So this is uh, a class that 
that inherits from observable collection of gain. Uh, can you see that? Yeah, it's yeah, just about. Okay. Hopefully they can see it as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what we have here is in the constructor, in the initializer for games, uh, I'm actually reading in an XML file which is going to create an array of game objects. So okay. even though I'm reading an XML file, this is definitely CLR object binding, mm, just, to, mm. just to set the record straight on there. If I save this, I can now open this up in Blend. So basically, just to summarize, we've got, we've got mm -hmm. collection class, it's yep. a collection of games, collection of games. Game, game objects, and in the, initi and, and the initializer, you, you're just, well, you're just populating that, essentially. Populating yeah. that. Okay, yep. great. All right. So, I mean, obviously, the, the, the difference here, though, is um, in, the, in the final application, I mean, it, it's probably likely that that class will be populated Mm. based on some event that happens at runtime. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I've put that in the initializer is because we want to do some design time. We want to look at some data at design time. Yes. Uh, so that's, that's, that's why we're doing that in the initializer. But normally, when it comes to the final release, you would take the initializer code out and then wait for that to be populated. Mm. So I'm going to pop, pop this open. And now, if I jump to my property uh, project panel, Instead of adding XML data, I'm going to add CLR object data. And if I scroll down, so what are we looking at there? These are all the these, these are all the uh, so it's looked at all the references that I have in this application. So right, okay. the WPF presentation stuff, some system references, all the CLR objects I could potentially bind to. And if I come down to my actual Xbox game search uh, application. You can see that I've got a CLR object game, and I've also got a CLR object game collection. Right, okay. So I'm just going to select OK. That's now populated the data panel with some uh, with a, an array of game collections, so I now know that because that says array, I can pick that up and drag it on, and say that I want to bind this, let's say, to a list box. And let's bind this to the item source. And it's again, it's looked at the CLR object, and it's actually analysed it and said, okay, it's got a title, a publisher, a genre, and it's also got a box image. And I can use this data template editor uh, to actually begin to create what I want you know, this to look like. So, so this is our template editor again, isn't it? This is our template editor, so I've got a picture right. of the box and you know, some other things there. Fantastic. And there we go. So this is actually, yeah, this is, this is data, CLR object data at design right. time. Fantastic. Okay, so all we need to do really was the key, the key thing here. Obviously, having been passed the the actual objects, is to just be able to initialize those. So, our our designer or interactive, you know, our developer who's developing UI needs to be aware of how to initialize those objects so they can be viewed at design time. That's right. That's, that's right. And it, it it is just a you know just a small thing that it might be go to the database and pull a couple of objects down. In this case, it's have a quick look at an XML file and create some objects from that XML. Mm. Um, but as long as there's something in the initializer for, for that collection class, you'll be able to see something at design time. Super. That's great. Thank you for that, guys. No well, um, we're almost out of time. Um, just swing back around here. Hopefully, um, that's given you a little bit of insight into some of the work these guys have been doing. Uh, you know, the sort of real world um, work they've been doing around WPF, some of the challenges faced with. Um, you know, working with designers and developers together, some of the different approaches that can be taken. Um, any particular last words, guys, or, or was, we think we've covered most of the things we wanted to cover? Covered just about everything, really, yeah. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Well, sorry, Martin, go on. You're gonna... oh, I, I was going to do a kind of like a Jerry Springer final word thing, just for, you know, for, for any designers that might be watching. Um, is, and it's, it, it's really just to say again that with WPF, for designers, uh, if, if they're going to work alongside developers in, in a way that's kind of really effective, there is a learning curve and you know, there are things that uh, they're going to have to you know, begin to understand. Same as developers, there's a learning curve for developers, but there, there is also one for designers and they're going to have to begin to understand you know, what is it that is behind building software. You know, they're going to have to perhaps begin to understand the concept of what a control is. Maybe they don't, have, they don't need to know the technical detail of, of what a control is, but begin to understand you know, behaviours and interactions. And in fact, a lot of interactive designers kind of already are aware of these things anyway. Um, but yeah, my, probably, again, my top tip is if you're going to go into WPF design, uh, is to, you know, is to 
perhaps download Visual Studio, or begin to look at the XAML, and begin to look at what's been created behind the scenes. Because I found that what has really kind of accelerated my personal development of WPF is actually understanding what happens in the background and not simply relying on you know what I can do in the design service surface. So uh, yeah, that would be my superb. No, that's great, Martin. Right, guys. Well, I hope uh, you all enjoy that, found it helpful, and uh, that's us signing off. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.